Tonight's title is The Apple of His Eye. I think you've all heard that expression. Speaking of a child who is loved by a parent, and you speak of the child as the apple of his father's eye. He worships him. He loves him. He can do no wrong. Well, this is really from the Bible. If you read it in the 32nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, or the second of Zechariah, and God found Jacob in a desert, in a howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him and kept him as the apple of his eye. Apple of the eye means the pupil of the eye. A very precious thing indeed. But the word apple means literally the little man. Referring to the reflected image of the one who beholds himself in the eye of the other. So he found him and kept him as the apple of his eye. Then God will see what God looked like. When the eye was formed, he could look right into the eye and see his own image and decide to let us make man in our image. So we are told, how can this little Jacob stand? He is so small, as told us the book of Amos. How can he stand? He is so small. Look into the eye of anyone, and you see not the one, but you see yourself reflected. And if you smile, it smiles. If you are angry, it is angry. You can't see the other. You see only yourself. So here we have in this simple little statement, God's plan, His wonderful power to create His image now, because He has to know what He looks like before He can create it. And so He sees now His image reflected in the eye of a seeming other. So He found Jacob, and then He find him, found him in the desert in the howling waste of the wilderness. And then he encircled it. And he cared for it. And he kept it as the apple of his eye. And then he starts the work on this image. To endow it with life as God himself has life. To endow it with the creative power. Not just an animated form, but to actually give to it all that God, the creator of it, possesses. And that is our story concerning this grand mystery. In this 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, there is this beautiful imagery. And may I tell you, it is all true. It seems strange. The rock, his work is perfect. The rock, and now it becomes a person, his work is perfect. And we are unmindful of the wrath that we got us. And we have forgotten that God who gave us birth. So he equates the rock with God. The rock's work is perfect. And all through that thirty second chapter, the word rock is referred to. And you might think, why? Why is this innocent? It doesn't make sense. So let me share with you an experience that happened to me 30 odd years ago, back in the 30s. Sitting in the silence, not thinking of anything in particular, just meditating, with my eyes closed against the other world, and my attention turned inwardly. And suddenly all the dark conclusions of the brain become luminous, as they do. They become luminous, golden, 
make you feel light. And you simply bask in what you below. It's fun. And suddenly, a huge force, this enormous force, appeared around. As I looked at it, it became fragmented, shattered into numberless pieces. And just as quickly, it was reassembled, but not into the rock, reassembled into a human form, sitting in a lotus posture, in deep, deep meditation. And as I looked at it, I saw it was myself. I am looking at myself in a profound meditation. And I completely lost myself in this contemplation. And it glowed and glowed and glowed. And it reached the intensity of the sun. And then it exploded. And I returned to this level of awareness. So here the imagery is true. The rock, his work, is perfect. Why the rock? Because it came in vision. Why have I forgotten? Why am I unmindful of the rock that begot me? And I have forgotten the God who gave me birth. But what is it all about? It's self beginning. God achieves his limitless designs by a self limitation. You yourself are begetting yourself. You are bringing yourself out. And by the self-limitation, you will bring yourself out. If you make the eye, you must first make the eye, the apple of your eye. And when you see that as a reflection, then you know who you are. Because you have to forget who you are, to become what you are. And being in the form of man, he now has completely forgotten that he ever was other than man. So here is our presence was once in the form of the infra being called God. And he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave and was made in the likeness of man and became obedient unto death, even death upon the cross of man. And having done that, he has completely forgotten the rock that he really is, for he is the rock. He is this eternal rock, this creative rock. But as we begin to expand, begin to awaken, all the energy of scripture comes back. And so I didn't sit down with conscious thought. I hadn't the slightest idea when I sat in my home that day, with my eyes closed, and my attention turned in into my skull. That, that rock would appear. I certainly didn't conjure it. And suddenly before my eyes comes the rock, this enormous quartz, and then fragmented, assembled into a human form, seated in the lotus posture, in profound meditation. And as I look at it, I am looking at the image of myself, for I saw in that eye, the apple of my eye, I saw myself. And from this rock, I form the being that is my image. And work upon it until it becomes luminous, becomes real, when it becomes completely alive, so I can endeavor it with myself. For your child, the rock, his work is perfect. And be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And in the same chapter we are telling, is he not your father who created you? He who made you and established you, is he not your father? And then the question is asked, what is his name? Whose name? The one who established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Well, the minute the second question is asked, you get the answer of the first. What is his name? And what is his son's name? 
for the when I say what is his son's name, I know at least he is God. If he has a son, then in the first question asked to be, that answer is a father. I will not call him Mr. Brown, Mr. John, Mr. something. At least he is father if you ask him what is his son's name. So here I'm getting a son. In my image. The perfect image of myself that I expect. And I use everything in this world to further my will to create my image. Yes, God's will for man is advanced even through the cold surgery of war. He takes war, takes convulsions, takes everything to advance his will to fulfill his purpose, which is that us make man in our image. Well, I can't make man in my image until I know my image. I must first know my image. And my image is reflected only in the pupil of the eye. And so here the apple of his eye, which is the pupil of the eye, that most precious part of the eye. And the word apple means the little, the little man. And so you look into the eye and see yourself in miniature, this tiny little thing. So in the book of Amos he asked the question, because he found Jacob. And he asked the question, how can Jacob stand? He is so small. This tiny little thing, the limit of contraction. And then, having reached the limit of contraction, then he begins to expand. And he expanded beyond the wildest dream of man. For God took upon himself a limit of contraction for the purpose of expanding. There is no limit to expansion. No limit to translucency, only a limit to contraction and a limit to opacity, but not to its opposite. So he made himself a limit, and by assuming the limit, he achieves his wonderful limitless purposes, his desires. Now on this level, we can prove it. That is on the mystical level. I share with you my experience with the Ram. The story that I told you last year of Jung, Carl Jung, when he was in a deep state of depression. He had a heart attack, a broken leg, he was in an oxygen tent, and in despair of his life. And he found himself in some strange, wonderful land, moving towards a little wayside chapel. And here is, the door was ajar, so he walked into the little chapel, walked up to the altar, and to his surprise it looked like a Christian church, but it had no crucifix and no image of the Blessed Virgin. And so he wanted to fly. But in the place of these two, that you usually find in Christian churches, there were beautiful flowers, which he preferred, lovely flowers all around the altar, to him that's a poor better thing to have than these little things on the wall. And looking down, he noticed a figure seated in the lotus posture. And looking closer, he recognized himself. He himself was seated in the lotus posture. And then he became a little bit disturbed, in fact a little bit afraid, and said he to himself, Aha! So it is you who is meditating me. And I know when you are there, I will no longer be. Well, I wouldn't say he is meditating you, or you meditating him. It's one. In the end, there will only be the one. He is actually expanding himself by this act of creation. There will not be two, just one. There will be also speak as you, just me. I will know. I did it for a purpose. And yet I didn't bring this being into this world to rob him of individuality. We are one. A complete fusion, a complete absorption takes place. But on this level, let us show you how we 
we work it in the most practical manner. I don't have to look into the pupil of your eye to get what I'm looking for. When I know what I want, I can stop to see using you without your knowledge, without your consent. I bring others into a scene. I may this eavesdrop upon a conversation taking place which I am controlling. And I hear you discuss my good fortune. Or the good fortune of the one who I want to help. And so when I see the whole thing in my mind's eye clearly, I know that the potency of this picture is in its implication. What is it implied? Not the words, not your face, not the handshake, not this, but it is implying something. And its creative power is in its implication. So all of a sudden I hear you say to someone else, have you heard the good news about I'm listening carefully? And then they say, yes, I've heard it. And then I listen to the conversation. I'm seeing it all in my mind's eye. Then we understand why in Scripture, the 40th chapter of Psalms, he has bored a ear for me. We think the other is, but we don't hear. For we only hear the outer sound. And he has bored an ear for me. And he thanks me for pouring the air that allows him to hear these inaudible sounds, these things that only you alone can hear. So you construct a scene implying the fulfillment of your dream, which, as you construct it, may use the medium of sound. And so you listen to the voice of those present. And you hear it because you are imagining that they're saying exactly what you want to hear. And when you hear it, the don't say of that picture is what it is implying. And I think in the now distant future, what it implies, you will realize. Just as God, looking into my eye, which he first had to make, that could reflect to me. And the God who was doing it was my very own being, this only God. And so he made this form and made it sensitive to reflect what he looks like. And when he knows exactly what he looks like, then he can make me in his image. So the rock, his work is perfect. And that was the rock. His work is perfect. Prior to that moment, I had forgotten the rock that began me. I was unmindful of it. I'm mindful of the God who gave me birth. And then it happened. And I saw the reason behind this strange, peculiar symbolism, this imagery of Scripture. So we are born, do not change it. If I take the word rock out of the Bible in that chapter, because it offends. In this little simple verse, for instance, they came to the man and they said, Where are you staying? And he said, Come and see. And they came with him, and they remained with him, because it was the tenth hour. There was one translation of scripture called the English Bible, the New English Bible. It's the most modern translation. This is what they said of that passage. They came and they stayed with him, because it was 4 p.m. All the difference in the world Yes, if you start at 6 in the morning, and you have a measured stay, and the day begins at 6 in the Hebrew world, it does. When you add 10 hours to 6, it would be 4 p.m. But you are going to get the meaning behind 4 p.m. as it makes the word 10. And they came to him, and they said, where are you staying? Come and see me. So they followed him. And following him, they remain with him because it was the king hour. Well, king is a numerical value of the hand. The first letter in the name of God. Yod is ten. Yod hey, vav hey. And ten means the creative power. The power to create. They came 
in the soul of the secret of creation. So they remain with him. This is the power that creates. But if you're going to translate it, give it sense. What does 4 p.m. mean? Has nothing to do with the great mystery. So they came to his place and they found where he was staying. Well, where am I staying? Where are you staying? That state to which we must constantly return constitutes our current place. You can lift me out of my world right now with a joke, and then one second later, I go back into my depression. Pull me out again, go back into my depression. So the state to which I must constantly return, that constitutes where I'm staying. And where does he stay? In the tenth hour. Always creating, not 4 p.m., has nothing to do with it at 4 p.m. So the minute we tamper with God's great word by changing it to make it, to give it sense, I'm just about to take the word wrong out of the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy to give it sense. Because not when a rock becomes a person, the rock, his work is perfect. He equates the rock with God. Wait, the day will come and suddenly you too will be in the silence. And then something will happen as you turn your attention inward. And then the rock will appear before you. It will fragment. And when it reassembles into the human form, you're going to see yourself. And you're going to see exactly what you saw when you looked in to the eye of Jacob. That state of consciousness called the little one. For when you see into the pupil of the eye, you always see yourself. You never see another. And you see yourself in miniature. Now you know exactly what you look like. So you take the rock and you break it. And then you reshape it and make it conform to what you saw. And it's yourself. You can't see another. God cannot see another. There is no other. That great Shema, the confession of faith, of the Hebrew world. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. There is a common community, but in our language, Hear, O Israel, the I am, our I am, is one I am. So in the end, one I am, and this one I am, Contracting itself sees multitude. Expanding itself, it sees one. The day will come, you will see it. You will see this one man containing all. And as you contract your limitless senses, it's fragmented into numberless nations and races and people. But then, as you expand the senses, it becomes one. So here all is you. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. So tonight, you take it on this level. Because the other you can't invoke. It just happens. It happens as the automatic growth and expansion of consciousness. I certainly did not sit down in the hope of ever seeing the wrong. It never occurred to me when I sat that day in my pub, that in the silence I would see anything. I didn't see anything. I simply saw the light, which is an automatic reaction when you withdraw from the outer world. It's golden liquid light and it pulses all through your head. And it goes all like small rings. And you can control it. You know, you are off like a funnel. Or stop it. But ring after ring after ring. If you don't stop it, it forms one solid funnel. But if you stop it, you can disperse it. And it's a joy doing it. That's all I intend to do. When suddenly, the cross where a name shattered. I saw no hand, no creative hand to mold it, but it was molded into a living form. A pulsing living form. Not some little statue. And when I look at it, I'm looking at myself. So I first had to see Jacob, and know him to be the apple of my eye. If I couldn't find the apple of my eye, I wouldn't know what I would like. 
for God couldn't see himself, they can see that they're reflected in the pupil of the eye of man. So he has to make the pupil. He has to make it like a mirror that can reflect him. And then he takes one good look and he sees exactly what he looks like. Then he starts the work upon man. So tonight, if you have an objective for anyone in this world, don't ask anyone if it's possible. You want it? That's good enough. Don't ask the individual. Say you ask this much of yourself. Is it a loving thing? Would I want it for myself? Would I in that position? If you could answer in the affirmative, yes, well then it's right. Whenever you exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of another, you are literally mediating God to that other. So don't ask anyone if it is right. It's always right if it is done in love. So you bring before your mind's eye a scene, a simple scene. And may I tell you, if you tell it to others, they may criticize you for it, and they will say, well, was that a loving thing? Well, it's their preference. Was that the loving thing? Like someone looking at a building and reading a title. Which title, if true, would imply ownership by the one who beholds it? And yet it wasn't his building. All right, I wouldn't criticize the one. He looked and he saw his own name on the marquee. And in the not distant future, that building was for sale. And he had no money. And a total stranger became the means through which he owned it that day. They brought the man in full and owned it 100%. Got it for, in those days, $50,000 was an awful lot of money. He had 50,000 pennies. 50,000 pennies would be a tremendous sum for him in that day. That day being 1924. He paid it all. And last year, that man sold the building, not for business, only the building. He consolidated his business with a far bigger business. But the building he could be sold for $840,000. He bought it in 24 for 50 and sold it last year for 840. And there was no capital gain in the area where he resides. $150,000 in cash. As a friend of his who really 
was his best friend, said he. And yet you were not friends when this thing started. This is how this principle works. The power was in what the name implied. If I see a marquee and it bears my name in full, there may be another one bearing my name in this world. But if I am looking at it, I feel that's my name and it means it's mine. Well, what does it imply? I am the only one. See it. And in a way that I do not know, the power is in its implication. That's the power. And it comes that way. So God looked into your eye and he saw himself. The apple of his eye. So he inserted you. He cleared you. And kept you as the apple of his eye. And brought you out of the desert. This wild wilderness. And then finally, he fused with you for enough with his own image. And the two became one. So there will not be two gods, only one God. There can't be two gods. So in the end, you don't lose. You simply are one with it. Your fall who created you. And you are the fall. And he proves to you that you are a father because he sets up in the beginning how he's going to prove it. He sets it up by naming a son. And this son is God's only beloved son. And he sets him up in the beginning. So when he takes his image that is in his own eye perfect, he has not revealed his fatherhood. And the son reveals it for him. The Son of God comes into your presence. You now one with God. And you see God's only begotten Son, but he doesn't look over your shoulder to call another one God or Father. He looks at you and he calls you Father. And you know you are his Father. That's how he reveals this union of the image and himself. So you're not an image anymore. You are God. So this is the apple of his eye. That everyone in this world is being formed until that eye can really reflect the Creator. And when it reflects the Creator, then he inserts him, cares for him, and calls him and keeps him the apple of his eye. Until that moment in time, he can actually produce a perfect image of himself. And then absorb the image, and he and the image are one. And whatever he wants before absorption, the image which is now one with God has to experience. So if he was a father, then I'm a father. So in this 32nd chapter, the word father is used with the rock. Is he not the father who created me? Is he not my begetter who created me but uses the word father? And so, in this wonderful book called the Bible, we have all the beautiful uh, symbolism and imagery that men and women, as they begin to unfold, find unfolding within themselves. Don't change it. Don't turn from one little state back what we told us a few minutes ago, from it was 10 to 4 p.m. It was the 10th hour. All the difference in the world. As we were told, he went forward into the world. And he was told to go into a strange land. And there he would be enslaved for 400 years. And do you think it means 400 years? No. As long as I know this body, and I don't really drop this body when men call me dead, I am instantly restored to life in a body that is just as real as this until the very end of my journey. And that journey isn't 400 years. Scripture measures it as 6,000 years. But 400 had to be used. 600 or 6,000 would only convey it, the meaning. For every letter in the Hebrew world, has a numerical as well as a symbolical value. So when Abraham was told he would be enslaved for 400 years, 
then he will go out and give him the promise. 400 is the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Its symbol is that of a cross, and this is the cross. He was a hundred years old when this child was born. A hundred years old. I think you, you and I will make up time. But a hundred is a numerical value of the 19th letter, Koth. And Koth has the symbolical value of the back of the skull. And that's where the drama takes place. It's all here in the skull. So this is the rock of which we are unmindful. Completely unmindful of this rock. So they put him into a tomb that was hewn out of a rock. What rock? This rock. And that's where he sleeps and dreams the dream of life. He dreams it for his 6,000 years. At the end of the dream, his image is complete. He fuses with the image that they are two, they are one. Then you will know the mystery of that second chapter of Genesis, where man, who is God, God is man. So he becomes man. And then comes an emanation. The emanation is his image. She comes out of him. So you read the words. My emanation, yet my life, till the sleep of death is past. And so, my emanation comes out, it is my wife, my image. But in the end, I must leave everything. I'm pleased to my wife until we become one. Well, the wife is not flesh and blood. The wife is the image that I saw in the apple of my eye. There is the apple of my eye. And I saw my emanation, my reflection, and fell in love with it. And it took me 6,000 years of torture. Maybe with some lovely things, but much of a torture. To actually move it into something alive, that I could be one with it. And then in the end, we become one being, not two. So tonight, on this level, you try it. Try it with a friend. And see if not in the distant future, it works and proves itself in performance. It will. And don't be disturbed when others are disturbed. Don't be disturbed. It doesn't really matter. He's working on us to mold his eye so he can see his perfect reflection before he can start the work. That was just about time for a silence. And then we have the questions. No more any questions, please. Yes, sir. No. No, I was simply sitting as you are now, with my eyes shut, my attention turned on the inside, into my skull, and just wait, and just a matter of seconds, you're all these dark convolutions of the brain grow luminous. Become golden. And this, you're surrounded with golden liquid light. I did not anticipate anything. I didn't think of anything. I simply enjoyed doing it. And then came this sudden course before my vision. But I do not do anything physically to induce it. No physical lotus posture. I saw the energy in the lotus posture. But I was not. First of all, it would be to me a most uncomfortable position. I wasn't trained to sit that way. And so I sit as the rest of us sits on a chair. Quite often I recline on a couch. But whatever to me is the most comfortable, so I'm not called by the pressure of the body. That to me is the way to do it. Any other questions, please? The memory is with you forever, but you don't walk in the light. In the sense that you are aware of it. You come down to the world 
to see something. She said, let's remain on the march of transfiguration. He said, no, we must go down into the cities and the villages. So you don't remain up, but you do have a memory of what happened. And it's with you forever as far as the memory goes. For any time. Anyone here to sit quietly, turn their attention inwardly, don't try to force it, and then in a little while you find the light coming. It comes automatically. The rock was something like this huge sonic force. And I didn't know what would happen, I just simply looked at it. And it broke. Fragmented. And then quickly reassembled. <coughs> what hands did it, I don't know. I only that I took the human form, seated in the nervous posture, and then I saw it myself. Sense. You mentioned the heart. But when they're describing the 
actual situation they meant, they come right down to the rock and speak of the rock as the tomb, the tomb is a sepulchre, the sepulchre is called rock, and then Luke comes right out and spells it right out in big bold type, the skull. So I have to go along with what I had experienced. But I know there are so many schools of thought in the world where men got together and thought, this is what, what it ought to be. And they write textbooks on what it ought to be. And then they teach and graduate people in a certain ism. But that's not vision. Mine is vision 100%. I'm not speculating. Yes, sir. her daughter. My daughter lives in England. Her husband is English. The mother is English, but she became an American subject, a citizen. And so she simply desired to see her daughter. And as soon as she was looking at the daughter, when the daughter came in and started fixing something in the mantelpiece, she then turned around and saw her. <coughs> and they both saw each other. And both were equally startled. And it broke the spell. But the daughter wrote, and confirm it. I've done it numerous times. Anyone. I said man is all imagination. Therefore man must be wherever he is in imagination. You look at a man and you think whether he's there. Is he really there? He can be plumbing the most horrible thing in the world and you see him sitting in a pew in church. Is he really there? He is plotting and planning something. So he knows where he is plotting and planning. Well, time is up until tomorrow. Thank you.